Hi, I'm Alan Smith and welcome to the show. Today we're going to focus on an area that's really important to me and that's conservation and preservation. Take Miss Big Fig behind me. Miss Big Fig is a hundred year old Celeste fig. She's a living example of a preservation. Let's get started by taking a look at the founder of the Ozark Society, Dr. Neil Compton. He led the Ozark Society in a 10 year campaign to save the Buffalo River from being dammed. We owe a lot to Dr. Compton and people like him who are passionate, they have vision and conviction. Even today, members of the Ozark Society still have fond memories of Dr. Compton as they carry on with their motto of conservation, education, and recreation. Alice, how'd you become so interested in conservation? Well, I really became inter interested in uh, conservation when I came to Arkansas. I met Neil and was just immediately inspired by his demeanor and his words. It's conservation, education, and recreation. And really, they're all, they all intertwine. It was given to us by the founder, Neil Compton, and we pretty much stuck, stick with that. Anything from, oh, picking up litter or doing cleanup of the Buffalo River to educating people on threats to the river or watching our national forests and things like that. And then we do a lot of recreating. We sponsor hiking trips and canoeing trips and things like that. For someone to care about uh, the places we love, the bluffs, the rivers, uh, the wildlands, they've got to be out in it. So we want them to go on our outings. We want to introduce places to them and we want them to fall in love so that then they will want to conserve. Conservation is important for the state of Arkansas because everybody in Arkansas likes to get out and get on the water or go hiking and so forth. It's just, it's the natural state. My husband and I were talking the other day about how much we've learned from the people in the Ozark Society. Uh, you know, I've learned scientific things that I didn't know I was going to learn, but I've also learned about gorgeous places and how to get to those places and how to be safe. There are some threats to the Buffalo River. It is a national river and the Clean Water Act and all those kinds of things protect the river and it's got sort of a special status. And yet we were surprised when industrial farms start being proposed for the river and one got put on the river, actually a tributary, but close enough so we think it's a potential danger for the water quality. The water quality in the Buffalo River is wonderful, and for the most part, you can swim in there with no concern about whether you're gonna be uh, in trouble in some way physically, but you know that every summer, some places get closed down because of E. coli or excessive algae or something else. We just wanna make sure that doesn't happen to the Buffalo River. We've had moments of just utter beauty, but it's also an outlet to express my desire for conservation. Places that I love, I want protected. Stay tuned to see our adventure on the mighty Mississippi. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. You know, there's nothing like engaging with nature. You can do it in many ways, by hiking, cycling, and of course, paddling, which is a lot of fun. Just a short distance from Helena, Arkansas, along the Mississippi River is Buck Island. The public island has 900 acres of native forests and sand beaches. It's perfect for camping, swimming, bird watching, and nature photography. Buck Island is the anchor of a particular stretch of river that starts here and goes down to Greenville, Mississippi, that is perhaps the wildest of the wild lower Mississippi River. Saw a bunch of deer and uh, turtles. 
and a uh, bobcat in a tree. Conservation is very important in, in eastern Arkansas. There's shorebirds and all kinds of species are coming through and using the wetlands and the timber bottomland areas that are still around. Agricultural fields and other habitat all play a very vital role in the, in the uh, resource that makes sure a survival of that resource. It creates this experience right here in the middle of the country in some of the most industrial agricultural land in, in North America. And that is the experience of wilderness, of being out in a big wild place all by yourself. Let's back a little ways up this, and then we'll come back out. Back paddle, everybody. Most of the land along the Mississippi River and the islands on the river are privately owned, which means that you don't have access to them. And that's part of the problem, is that the Mississippi River is really owned by the elites. Only a few people have access to it. So Buck Island is a place that anyone is welcome to come to experience the beauty of the Mississippi River. It's the place where you can come boating, come bird watching, hiking. Um, there's so many opportunities for people to come and enjoy what the Mississippi River is like. We'll see a lot of warblers today. There are 50 of them and they all have a little bit of yellow in them. And the most remarkable one is the prothonotory warbler, which is brilliant yellow. Buck Island is the perfect nesting place for our songbirds. Some of the most unique birds that we see probably during the migration are the white pelican, the wood storks, the roseate spoonbills. My experience with the river goes back to almost my first memories uh, of campfires and fishing on the banks with my family. And it's, it's just like it was uh, 2,000 years ago. It puts you in your place in the natural world and it gives you time for peace and tranquility, and it's beautiful out there. It's a river unlike any other river in our country and in North America and arguably the world. Um, I think its best comparison would be the Amazon or the Congo. The drops of water that are in the river right now have traveled from Colorado, they've traveled from Canada. All of us are connected through that river. I just think it's so important to get out on the river, get outside. Um, it's fun, it's good family entertainment. Everyone can do it, it's, uh, it's, it's safe. It gives us an outlet to what is like a national park-like place that has been compared to Alaska in terms of its wildness. And you don't always see that when you're uh, crossing the bridge. You cannot experience the beauty until you take that boat ride over and walk those white sand beaches or go out into the woods. It is such a unique piece of property that you got to see it for yourself. And when you get out to these islands like Buck Island, um, oftentimes there's no one out there but you and the deer and the coyote and the birds. Brave work, me laddies, brave work, I say. It makes you feel like you're alive and connected to uh, everything around you. We look through the lens and focus on the talents of nature photographer Tim Ernst when we return. You know, I think gardening and photography go hand in hand because there's so much beauty to take in. In fact, you want to take a picture of it so you can remember it or share it with someone. You just want to seize the moment Tim Ernst is known as Arkansas's wilderness photographer. He's an outdoorsman and hiker that's preserved the natural beauty of the state with his images of wildlife, flowers, and landscape. I've found many times after seeing some of Tim's photography that it makes me want to visit those locations, take photographs, and get involved in conservation myself. Let's walk across here and go in there. I spent a a lot of my time taking pictures in Northwest Arkansas, which is where I live, and the Buffalo River area is just 10 or 15 minutes away from here, and there's so much diversity. Being a nature photographer kind of gives me the chance to walk outside the door and anything can be my subject. If there's great light happening somewhere, that's the main thing I go after. Here's an example of where 
It was just kind of a serendipity moment where we lived near Hawksbill Craig and I shot there for about an hour and nothing much was happening. So I packed all my equipment and turned to walk away. And I turned around and looked and the, the sky just sort of opened up and these God beams started coming down. I pulled out my camera equipment and shot four or 500 pictures of this scene. And this is one of my most favorite and most commercially successful photographs of all time. I can live anywhere on the planet and I can take pictures of whatever and probably scratch out a living, but I still live in Arkansas and plan to the rest of my life because I love it here year round. A lot of the scenery is very intimate. It's close up. You can park your car to trailhead and hike, in some cases, a very short distance to get to a beautiful waterfall or maybe a half a mile to get to the top of an incredible scenic vista. And what you're looking at is not urban America. So much of Arkansas is still what I call wilderness America. I think one of my biggest uh, careers in life is to try and reach out and grab people and say, look at what we've got here in Arkansas, and you can go see that without too much effort, and get them to be comfortable going out, getting away from, their, uh, from the cities or wherever. The more people do that, the more people will gain a sense of appreciation for what we've got here. And it's my hope that later on in life, when there is a question about an area or an issue or something like that, they'll remember, they'll say, you know what, this is worth preserving. We want more of this in my neighborhood. You don't want to miss the beauty of this natural spring, all coming up next. I love making strolls in the garden and just thinking about where so many of the plants come from. And I'm often reminded just how many native plants we grow here at the farm. For instance, this one. This one is agave americana, or the variegated agave. And it's a really extraordinary plant. Uh, you can see it's very architectural. And this is one that you grow in the southern parts and the drier parts of the country. But we also grow things like purple coneflowers, black-eyed Susans. Some of these native beauties you'll see at the Blue Spring Heritage Center in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. The Blue Spring itself has been a natural tourist attraction since 1951. The spring water is a beautiful, clear blue color and been tested as some of the purest water in the region. In recent years, new owners have focused on preserving the spring's early history and connection to Native American culture. It's clearly a nature lover's destination to add to their must-see list when visiting Northwest Arkansas. Well, my name is John Fuller Cross. I'm a fourth generation native of Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And in 2002, I bought the property and have owned it ever since. We call it Blue Spring Heritage Center. My main interest in it was, was, was making it stay a sanctuary. It's 250 acres. It's got three miles of shoreline on Table Rock Lake or the White River, depending on the level of the water. And uh, I'm a conservationist, and you know, I just wanted, I wanted to be here for my children. If you haven't already sensed it, it's a very quiet, peaceful place. There is a healing presence to this area. I think that in, in history, there was energy put into that back in the Native American time, and I think that still resides on this property now. We had some divers come in. They ended up going down 220 feet. It was quite the ordeal. We found a whole bunch of artifacts in there. Robert Chenal uh, did a dig here in 1971 under the bluff shelter over here. They dug up artifacts going back 10,000 years. And uh, we have some of those artif artifacts on display today. You know, when we bought the place, uh, the people in town were thought, because I'm a banker, that we were gonna carve it up and put in a golf course and put in houses and, 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 and do all of this stuff. No, that never was the plan. Never was the plan. It's to leave it like it is, but keep it beautiful. The medicine wheel was grown up over the top of my head. Uh, so we got in there and cleaned it up. We tried to kind of coordinate it. And now we're looking into trying to get in some medicinal stuff. 
It is such a pristine place. It's such a historic place. The peace and the tranquility of this park is bar none. I think it's for all people who always alive. No, we're not going to mess it up. Not in my lifetime, and I don't think kids will either. My friend Frank Reese stops by the farm and we discuss heritage poultry right after the break. Frank, these ancient foundational breeds are so important to the preservation of poultry. This is what it's all about. Right now, we have no other way of preserving these birds other than the live animal. Cattle, sheep, hogs, they can collect the egg, they can collect the semen and bring them back later. Can't do that with this. Yeah. These two are very, very, very old European breeds. The white-faced black Spanish goes back to the time of, of the Romans. What's unique about this particular breed is it's the foundation of our egg chicken. Yeah. This is where our Andalusians came from, our Menorcas, our Leghorns, all sure. these birds yeah. came from this ancient old breed. What you have over there, the silver gray Dorkin, that's the, an old English breed that we would have called dual production. At one time they were thousands of these and they were on farms and everything and they were very reliable. And again, this is a breed that's in great, great peril. I always tell people, you don't just go and buy silver gray Dorkins, you don't just go and buy bronze turkeys. You try to seek out a particular known line that has a history, because if you do, that'll tell you exactly what you're gonna get. The standard will tell you this was a breed that was developed not only to provide eggs for your table, but to provide you with a wonderful roasted chicken. And so you need to pay attention to the utility. The Bard Plymouth Rock is the greatest joy of my life. It is the, the original. It's the first pure American breed. The thing I wanted to do to save them was put them back on the table again. When I spoke at Penn State, Dr. Ed Bess, he said, to feel secure about the future of a genetic line, there needs to be 20,000. There are some wonderful people out there who are breeding these birds for show. Right but to find people who are willing to bring them back, to get them back on the tables again, to get the eggs back into the store again, that's what we need. Yeah. People bring them back up to that wonderful level that they were 50 years ago. Want to learn more? Visit pallensmith.com for delicious recipes, garden tips, blog posts, and our online store. I'm so pleased to see how Miss Big Fig continues to flourish even after 100 plus years. What I like to do each year in the spring, very early, I go in and take cuttings that are about the size of a pencil about six to eight inches long, and I root those. And you can see this is one that I rooted this year from one of those cuttings. This is a way for me to perpetuate the very good genetics Miss Big Fig has to offer. If you're like me, you see the importance of us conserving and preserving our land, water, animals, and of course plants. We need to preserve them for now to enjoy them as well as future generations. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith.